It's been a strange year. I think none of us are more interested in the end of a year than I am. But uh, it's been a challenging year to, to volunteer on the WQPL, but I wanted to talk about it a little bit anyways. We don't have the normal pictures of everybody up, up and about doing stuff. But uh, as you might guess, it's been a, a hard year to do stuff with a lot of folks. Everybody's kind of stuck on one side of the fence or one side of the glass or one side of the door when we all are kind of used to all being together. The interactions we've had as volunteers on WQPL, they haven't been what we would normally want, obviously. We wouldn't want just a little interaction. We'd like a whole lot. It's, it's utterly difficult to do the things that we want to do. Uh, but that said, oops, I skipped one. Some of the volunteer projects we've been doing that, you know, we did them because they were, they were important to the overall WQPL have turned out to be really significant this year. So the Slaughter Creek Trail and the Stennis Creek Trail, those are two trails on the water quality protection lands that were designed with sustainability in mind. So there's limited parking. They're be meant to be uh, more limited use trail. And during uh, this whole pandemic, those trails have been open except under normal closure conditions like wet or when there's a judge uh, in Travis County saying, hey, we need to close all parks. This is dangerous for folks to have this much interaction. So we've closed it then. Otherwise, these have been a great way for people to get out in nature and get away uh, from from crowds to socially distance and we didn't obviously we had no idea we had no design to do that it's just one of the benefits that works so we've been really happy to have these trails and to have you know all the volunteer work that goes into it it's not always this group that does the volunteer work on the trails but it's other volunteers and if you volunteered one place in the city you know there's a there's a large volunteer community so keeping that going has been uh, just a, a wonderful uh, bonus for folks now meanwhile in the background i don't want you to think i'm lazing around just sitting sitting around the house enjoying my own company because i do not enjoy my own company i i like visiting with you guys and working so we've been doing stuff what have we been doing we've been filling in pieces you know we got 72 million dollars in 2018 to keep buying land and protecting land for the water quality protection land so here's what we've done so it's kind of cool, over 1,100 acres in Fee Simple. This is stuff you guys are going to get to see, hang out on. I got some cool stuff to show you. There's, a, there's this uh, spring-fed creek on this place that just blow your mind. It's like it's all rock and dirt. And then there's this verdant green area. So anxious to show you that. And Monday, just Monday, we closed on two conservation easements that's over 550 acres. So combined, we've, we've done a lot. Not quite 2,000 acres, but when you put it all together, we do cross – the big milestone. So we crossed 30,000 acres uh, Monday, and that was super exciting to me because when I started, we only had 15,000. And the initial goal with the 1998 bonds were protect 15,000. So we were able to do that in a matter of, you know, a couple years, and it's taken multiple bond issues and a lot of time, 20 years, over 20 years to get up to double it. So hopefully we'll all still be around when we double it again, but uh, it won't be this year. Uh, so uh, I didn't want to leave you with kind of uh, anything but good news and you may have noticed an otter theme here and the reason is is with all the negatives we've seen in this pandemic and we've all struggled just to maintain our sanity especially me uh, the San Marcos River river I love swimming down a, a spring-fed river one of the beauties of, of central Texas with the much much reduced usage out there under the pandemic, people notice river otters back. So it was just August that uh, there was some good video of photos and, and Parks and Wildlife were like, that's an otter. That's really cool. And there's a lot more to it than just, you know, people not being in the river. There's international reasons why there's more otters, but it's still awfully cool that if nothing else, those otters made some progress this year. So congrats to the otters and to San Marcos Springs area. And, oops, pushing the wrong button. Look forward to getting everybody back on the land. Like I said, we got some cool things to show you, some crazy ecological work that needs doing, some karst work that's going to need doing, and then we really need to restore these human interactions that we've always had. So I think there's, we're going to have to remember how to do all that again. Uh, great new places to show you, and we have great impacts that we're going to be able to make there. Things that have only had cattle on them before, now we're going to be able to rethink them in an ecological way, and that's going to be exciting for me and, and our team and everyone on this call, hopefully. Um, but still, thanks for coming out. I mean, this is a hard way to spend your evening talking about volunteer work when it's challenging to do, but I appreciate everybody coming out. I love to see everybody, and uh, 
I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Nico Howard, somebody who's uh, only been managing the BCP for like three or four years, but has been managing and working around caves for, my estimate is 75 years. It could be more, I don't know. But uh, Nico's been around caves. He's uh, synonymous with the Martin Springs segment, the Edwards Aquifer and caves in general here. So Nico, all you buddy. Let me stop sharing. Here. Hey, thanks Kevin. I got to do the San Marcos River a couple weeks ago and it was fun, I have to say that much. Did All right. See, so did I'm. Uh, no. I didn't see any otters. No. Uh. -uh. When I did Houston a couple decades ago, we saw alligators, but no, no otters here. But apparently, there used to be alligators as far up as the San Marcos River in the old days. Um. So, let me share my screen. I'm Nico Howard, and I'm the program manager for the Falcones Canyonland Preserve. And um, here we go. Let me share my screen. And I'm going to do you a presentation about our appreciation for volunteers in, in 2020. Okay. There we go. Can y'all see that? Somebody sees it. Okay. So I wanted to appreciate the, uh, the work y'all did in 2020. It's like Kevin said, not as much. Um, because of the the uh, the, the COVID, um, we did see a lot of work in um, Onion Creek, uh, not Onion Creek, in in um, um, sorry, Long in Long Canyon, removing invasives. We saw a lot of work on the Vario Preserve, doing the restoration there. Um, and I just want to point out that the work we're doing together, it's not necessary for a department or for the city. This is for the land that we're have this connection with and share with. It's special. The, um, the wildlife there has sanctuary on our preserves and our future generations will have something really special that, uh, that will go on forever. And if you want to be real practical about it, they also improve the water quality, they reduce flooding, reduce traffic, and um, yeah. And so they're, so they're also really cool for those reasons too. And we love the wildlife out there. So part of it is Austin's heritage, the preserves that goes on forever, like I mentioned to you. And I think Austin appreciates it. A lot of the nature of Austin, the public's kind of scared about, you know? And so one of the things I appreciate is the, what I saw a lot in 2020 is a lot of the folks out there, volunteers, metro naturalists, neighbors on the next door post, you know, educating their neighbors about the nature, the preserves, about coyotes, about snakes, Wildfire risk was a big issue. Um, feral hogs this year was another issue. Um, and about the Balcones Canyonland Preserve. And, and I know Lynn and, and Jim particularly um, are really good at writing posts on, on um, you know, those kind of issues to kind of educate the public about it. This is our new no trespassing sign with this intimidating um, attack warbler that's going to warn people not to trespass on this preserve or you might get tweeted at seriously and so what we saw in 2020 is one one neighbor um saw a bunch of massive clearing on the preserve that someone was doing and reported it to us so we greatly appreciate those things even though we can't get out and do a lot of work on the preserve when when the neighbors and the volunteers can um you know educate the public and report things to us it's very valuable and i saw a lot of that in 2020 on the other side of town Village of Western Oaks, one of the friends of the preserves, um, caught somebody applying pesticides. Apparently, the homeowner association, one of the board members, was really irked with the with the weeds on the trail and hired a contractor to put Roundup on the trail. Even though we posted really clearly in this karst preserve, you can't apply pesticides ever. Um, so anyway, our friends of the preserves um, noticed this going on. They confronted them. They stopped them from doing it. And and even better, they. Um, they then got on the, the HOA board themselves and, you know, are very, very active in protecting the preserve this way. So I just want to mention how some, some things we appreciate. Now, one of the things, even though we defend the preserves and keep people out, it's a really a challenge for us to figure out ways, how are we going to get people on the preserves? Because for the long-term um, longevity of nature, people have to make connections with nature and the preserves, which means getting people out on the preserves how do we also encourage um, East Austin 
in all of Austin to see that, that, that this is a treasure for them too. So how do we reach out to them? And with our volunteer programs, you know, we have, it's been a great asset for us to help to get people on the preserve safely without damaging the preserves themselves. So that's the end of my presentation. That's all I got for you today. Don't have anything else. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on now to um, Audrey. Thanks, Nico. So we had some acquisitions on the WQPL. Um, was there anything, oh, Willow asks, how many acres were added to the WQPL this oh. year? I'm going to put the math at 1,100 plus 560, 1,110, 1,110 plus 560, that's 1,670 acres. Whoa, and on the spot math. That's impressive. Yeah. Um, yeah okay. Nico, did you want to say something about ECT? Oh man, we, we busted it. We did 37 acres this year. We really busted it. 37 precious acres. Yeah, so that's what we did. We got two preserves. We got um, Carol Lee Preserve in August. And then in February, we got um, most of the, the third largest cave in our permit is Whirlpool Cave. And so we got the majority of the cave um, for Whirlpool Cave. So that was five acres and then 34 for Carol Lee. And we're working on some more but we don't nearly compare to Kevin's numbers. We're, we're lucky if we get 200 acres in a year. You know, that would be, that's what we're working on Brightleaf now. And that's about 216 acres. Your acres are more expensive, Nico. And I'd say if we don't lose an acre, we're still winning. Um, as we look forward to the next 20, 50 years, one of the real challenges is going to be preventing the loss of acres. Uh, conservation land is, requires constant stewardship not just from volunteers but for protecting that land and we really need to engage with lawyers we're doing that now to say how do we keep protecting this from um, you know getting run over and getting getting cut apart so it's, it's something we do behind the scenes but not having a loss of acres i think for the next 20 years is going to be a real win if we can if we can hold on to everything we have right now and add to it at the same time and then Lynn had another a question. Are y'all working with the county on the future BCP Visitor Center? Nico, I don't know if you have a different answer for that. Or... I, I can give you a little answer that I know of, and, and Sherry may know as well, but um, they, they've uh, keep the surprise of it. They're acquiring it. Um, it's not something that I'm aware we have a direct, um, you know, um, participation in it. But Sherry might want to correct me or add to that. <laughs> Well, actually, I got to go out there today, which was amazing with Melinda. Um, we, Kimberly and I went out there for the first time to look at it. The county purchased the old SAS facility. So they got a, a building with it and that property right next to Grandview and next to kind of surrounded by Travis County BCP Preserve. And so they're very excited about that. They're going to be working on that future Visitor Center, they still have a lot of work to do to program the building or design the building and figure out where they're going to put offices and conference rooms and, and so forth. But it, it's amazing. And there's some incredible views from there. And we did a little hike. There's a hike down in the canyon. Um, but they'll have some areas on the 94 acres that, that they purchased that will be um, just kind of that they can let people do little hikes around there. And then they'll probably have guided hikes down in the canyon. And Kate and Audrey are talking with their outreach staff uh, about programming and kind of ideas for all that. So it's very exciting. We're all very excited about that, but it'll be a while before um, they get to a point where folks can, will be going out there. But they, they were able to keep the staffing for it in the budget, which was good. And I think all the commissioners are real excited about it. So they have a lot of support for it. So it's gonna be great. Thanks everybody for being here. And um, this is pretty short trivia and it's, um, I don't know, I'm always, maybe you don't have this problem. I'm always intimidated by trivia, um, but it was fun to put this together and it's very Wildlands focused. Um, and I guess a quick introduction. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Marissa Richardson. I'm one of the information specialists and I will be accompanied by Jaya Torres. I'll be going through and uh, asking the questions and she will give the answers. 
Um, so yeah, we can get started. Um, and like uh, Kate and Audrey said, if you want to answer questions as we're going, you can go ahead and look for the link to the Google Sheet to put in your answers right now, or you can get um, a pen and some paper to take notes while I go through the questions. Uh, so, yep, the first round is critters. Question number one, what poisonous papillon migrated across the wildlands last month? Now I'll be giving, I guess, maybe six to eight seconds in between each question so you get a chance to get an answer down. Two, what favorite WQPL critter commonly gives birth to identical quadruplets and whose name means little armored one? Question number three, which term refers to a critter that lives its entire life underground? A, troglobite, B, troglophile, or C, troglocene? Question number four, name the only bird endemic to Texas, meaning each one is born a Texan. Number five, what type of Central Texas cave invertebrate has venom in its tiny red pincers? Hint, it's sort of like a scorpion. And question number six, what recently delisted neotropical songbird enjoys the mountains of Mexico in the winter and nest in scrubby vegetation in central Texas each spring? So that is the end of round one. I'll give you a few minutes if you are if you were filling out while we were going along to just uh, finish that up and you can find uh, the link for the second round um, answer sheet in the chat and if you were taking notes um, you will have time after this round to be able to put all your answers into the Google Sheets so don't worry all right and so round two we're going to be focusing on plants Question number one, what tree species has the bark that golden cheek warblers need to build their nests? Question two, name a species of native plant food found on the wildlands that is a larval food for the monarch butterfly and gives them their toxicity. Question number three, what is the state tree of Texas? Hint, you can find it in riparian areas on the wildlands. Question four, which of these grasses is the non-native, highly invasive King Ranch blue stem? Four options here. Question five, all of these plants belong to the same family. What family is it? Scientific name, family name or common name for that type of plant. We've got honey mesquite, Texas blue bonnet, Texas kidneywood, and Texas mountain laurel. And question number six, which of these leaves is from a red oak? We've got four options.
All right, so that is the end of round one and two. We're gonna take five minutes so that folks who were taking notes can fill out their answer sheets and submit their answers. And after that five minutes is up, Jaya will join us and uh, read out the answers. And quick introduction for those of you who I haven't met yet, I'm Jaya Torres. I'm the other information specialist with the Wildland Conservation Division. So question one was, what poisonous papillon migrated across the wildlands last month? And that is a monarch. And Texas gets migrating monarchs in the spring and fall, and they actually migrated through on their way to Mexico in October. I was thinking it was a type of horse. So <laughs> if you got butterfly, monarch. <laughs> All right, question two. What favorite WQPL critter commonly gives birth to identical quadruplets and whose name means little armored one? And that is the armadillo and that is the featured animal on the new water quality protection lands logo. All right, question three. Which term refers to a critter that lives its entire life underground? A troglobite, troglobite, troglophile, or trogloxine? And that is going to be troglobite. So like the sicarina, the troglobites live their entire life cycles underground, and they often involve characteristics, characteristics like decreased pigment, slower metabolism, and reduced or absent eyes so they can survive. Uh, troglophiles are critters that have adapted to their dark surroundings, so things like beetles and worms, and they can either live their life inside or outside a cave. And a trogloxine is a cave guest, so technically, because these critters can only periodically live underground and they can't live exclusively in caves. So these are things like bats, rats, raccoons. And Nico and his team, I think they fit under that one too. <laughs> yeah, they can periodically live on the ground. I mean, they do, you know. <laughs> All right, question four. Name the only bird endemic to Texas, meaning that each one of these is born in Texas. And that is the golden cheek warbler. And they all nest in central Texas, and they're actually now in their wintering grounds in southern Mexico and Central America. Question five, what type of central Texas cave invertebrate has venom in its tiny red pinchers? Hint, it's sort of like a scorpion. And that is a pseudoscorpion. And these are different from scorpions and they lack a tail, but they do have venom in their pinchers. And this picture is a tooth cave pseudoscorpion and it's one of the endangered species that's protected on the BCP. I learned this. I did not know this before tonight, so I learned this just today. That I did not know. That's awesome news. Good. All right, question six. What recently delisted neotropical songbird enjoys the mountains of Mexico in the winter and nests in scrubby vegetation in central Texas each spring? And that is the black-capped vireo. These birds were actually delisted as endangered in 2016, although it's still important to continue to protect their habitat on the BCP in order to sustain their recovery rate. Okay. All right, so we're gonna move on to round two answers and that category was plants. So question one, was what tree species has the bark that the golden cheek warblers need to build their nests? And that is ash juniper, but we'll also take cedar since that's what they're commonly known as. Uh, the golden cheek warblers need the bark of mature ash juniper, so it's important that we maintain space for the younger trees to one day become mature and to continue to grow older. All right, question two. 
Name a species of native plant found on the wildlands that is a larval food for the monarch butterfly and gives them their toxicity. So we have zizotus, antelopornis milkweed, green comet milkweed, and Texas milkweed. And these are all different species of milkweed um, on the wildlands that support monarch populations. Question three, what is the state tree of Texas? Hint, you can find it in riparian areas on the wildlands. And that is the pecan, which is the state tree. These trees nuts were actually the first fresh snack for astronauts in space. And pecans typically produce nuts that can be harvested from October through December. All right, and question four was, which one of these grasses is the non-native, highly invasive King Ranch or KR blue stem? And yeah, that's gonna be picture B. And KR blue stem is a non-native grass that can be seen frequently along roadsides. Uh, Indian grass and silver blue stem are native species. So Indian grass you can see in picture A, and then uh, silver blue stems picture D. Those are native species that have ripe seed right now, and we've been collecting them on the water quality protection lands. All right, question five. All of these plants belong to the same family. What family is it? A scientific name or common name for that type of plant? And that's the uh, family of Fabaceae or the legume bean family. Fun fact, beans fix nitrogen in the soil. Uh, and then the blue bonnet, which is part of the Fabaceae family, is our state flower. And then kidney wood, which you can see there in the middle, uh, puts on a really nice flower show and you can, and really odorous, they smell really good. They can be seen uh, blooming around last month. All right, question six. Which of these leaves is from a red oak? And that is picture D. Uh, as you can see here, red oaks have bristle tips. White oaks like post oak and shin oak do not. The bristle tip is just the vein extending past the leaf blade margin um, or edge. So round three, water. Question number one, true or false, the recharge zone of the Edwards aquifer is where the water flows underground and to the aquifer. Okay, you guys gotta get this one. Question two, what's the name of a karst feature, AKA cave, in a creek bed? And I'm always saying this word. It's a little made up, but I'm always saying it, so. You've been on a walk with me. We've talked about both these things. I'm not gonna be mad, but I may be disappointed. Question three. What body of water is the source of drinking water for Austinites who get their water from Austin water? Question four. In a 2002 aquifer study that uses non-toxic dyes to trace groundwater, Nico showed that water can flow from driftwood to Barton Springs in as little as A, three hours, B, three days, C, three months, or D, three years. Question five. Austin lies on top of a karst limestone aquifer. You can find fossils of aquatic animals in the limestone from the Cretaceous period, which was about how many years ago? A, 20,000, B, 15 million, C, 100 million, or D, 
300 million. I think LBJ was president. It was a while back. We didn't have electricity or nothing. No mm. hints, no cheating, Kevin. It was rough. I'm just saying it was a rough time. It was hard. It was worse than now. Man. And question six. Which watershed contributes the most water to Brighton Springs compared to other contributing watersheds? We talk about this all the time. This is, <clears throat> I'm always A, Brighton Creek, B, Williamson Creek, or C, Onion Creek. And that is the end of round three. We will start round four, which is random knowledge. So it's question great, one. Great. Maybe back down. Um, which of these popular outdoor places is not part of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve? A, Hamilton Pool. B, Farmer's Ranch. C, Common Ford's Ranch Metro Park or D, Wild Basin? Question two, which of these animals has not yet been spotted on the water quality protection lands? A, an ocelot, B, mountain lion, C, a zebra, or D, a bobcat? Oh, this is a brilliant question. <clears throat> this, <clears throat> you had to go on a lot of hikes to get this one. <clears throat> this isn't a one hike knowledge thing here. This is a good one. Question three. Which wildland staff member is most likely to teach how to build berms and swales to rehydrate the landscape? A, Kevin. B, Jim. C, Bill, or D, Sherry? Question four. Fungi can be found on the wildlands. A, in cave ecosystems. B, being used to inoculate and break down logs. C, connecting tree root systems. D, all of the above. Question five, about how many species of plants have been identified by volunteer botanist Tom Watson on the Onion Creek track of the water quality protection lands? A, 100. B, 250, C, 300, or D, 450. I wonder if the number he hasn't identified is greater or smaller than the number he has identified <laughs> for this area. I think it's smaller. It'd be hard to prove. And the last question. Each spring, volunteers survey golden cheek warblers and record sightings of banded birds on the BCP to help biologists monitor populations. Each banded bird has a unique combination of bands on their legs. What is the correct band combination that a volunteer would report for the warbler pictured here? A, silver, white, orange, yellow. B, yellow, white, orange, silver. C, Silver, orange, white, yellow. And that is the end of our fourth round. All right, so round three, topic was water. Question one, true or false? The recharge zone of the Edwards Aquifer is where the water flows underground into the aquifer. That is true. 
and the pink in this map represents the recharge zone. And the water quality protection lands protects about 28%, but Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, of the recharge zone of, for the Barton Spring segment of the Edwards Aquifer. What was the number? 28%. That we protect. About. Yes. 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 Okay. All right. Question two. Um, what's the name for a karst feature, aka cave, in a creek bed? And that is a swallet. Uh, so this is a swallet or a cave opening in a portion of Onion Creek that runs through the water quality protection lands. Our great volunteers sometimes help us clean off and open up these features to aid in more water getting underground and to the aquifer. All right, question three. What body of water is the source of drinking water for Austinites who get their water from Austin water? And that is the Colorado River. So this is a view of the Colorado River from Mount Bunnell, which is part of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. Uh, the BCP helps protect city of Austin drinking water by protecting land around the tributaries and main flow of Bull Creek, which flows into co the Colorado River. Who knew there were so many houses right there? I've never seen this picture. I guess I've never been on Mount Bunnell, but holy cow, they're stacked in pretty deep there. All right, question four. In a 2002 aquifer study that uses non-toxic dyes to trace groundwater, Nico showed that water can flow from driftwood to Barton Springs in as little as three hours, three days, three months, or three years. And it's three days. The water will travel more than 20 miles in as little as three days underground. Pretty cool to think about how connected everything is, even if we don't see it. All right, question five. Austin lies on top of a karst limestone aquifer. You can find fossils of aquatic animals in the limestone from the Cretaceous period, which was about how many years ago? 20,000, 15 million, 100 million, or 300 million years ago. And that is a hundred million years ago. So uh, the Onion Creek Mosasaur was found in Onion Creek, not on the water quality protection lands, but still in the Onion Creek Creek bed. Water has been an important part of this landscape for a long time. And when the Mosasaur was swimming through most of Texas, uh, it was a shallow sea. Protecting land also protects this history. And this specific fossil can be found at the Texas Memorial Museum. I think Jurassic Park was more appropriately titled Cretaceous Park, but they went with Jurassic because it sounded cooler. It does sound tougher, I think. But Cretaceous Park, I kind of like the sound of it. It sounds a little crunchy though, like <laughs> grit in it. All right, question six. Which watershed contributes the most water to Barton Springs compared to other contributing watersheds? Barton Creek, Williamson Creek, or Onion Creek? And that is Onion Creek. Uh, it contributes to about 33% of the water that flows out of Barton Springs. Barton Creek contributes about 6% and Williamson just 1%. All of the surrounding watersheds in the Austin area are vital to contributing to spring flow and water quality, but protecting Onion Creek is especially important since it provides the lion's share of that Barton Springs flow. All right, round four, which was random knowledge. Question one, which of these popular outdoor places is not part of the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve? Hamilton Pool, Rymer's Ranch, Commons Ford Ranch Metro Park, or Wild Basin. And that is Rymer's Ranch. Rymer's Ranch is actually part of Travis County Parks and it runs along the Pernalis River. And this place also serves as some great golden cheek warbler habitat as well. 
Question two, which of these animals has not yet been spotted on the water quality protection lands? An ocelot, mountain lion, zebra, or a bobcat? And we haven't yet seen an ocelot, but never say never. Is um, it a zebra out there? A zebra? Yeah, Kevin, so I think you know a little bit more about the, uh, the zebra story. Yeah, that thing escaped from the zoo and it tore down one of our fences as it ran through Knoll onto Park House. So that fence, some volunteers actually helped us take it the rest of the way down. And it kept running. It got out of the zoo and that thing was gone. By the time they captured it, only a couple hours later, it was already off our property. That thing had run, run like a zebra from a lion, which that could have been a contributing thing because they got a bunch of lions there. Terrible to mix the lions and the zebras. Got to keep them separated. So then what's the, the story with the mountain lion, do you know? Oh yeah, there's a, we've had some very confirmed sightings and some unconfirmed sightings. And I saw a track once right at the water's edge that, you know, it could have been multiple tracks on top, but man, it looked like a cat track. It was so big, uh, but we've had some confirmed sightings back when Johnny Ross was here uh, <coughs> going out there at Onion. And we had a, an interesting kill at Slaughter what was now Mary Gay Maxwell. And then uh, we had a, a, a deer that was killed and kind of buried with, with leaves. Very unusual if it was anything but a mountain lion, but we couldn't confirm that. Huh. Interesting. Um, and then the bobcat, was that, where was that seen? Oh, everywhere. I mean, bobcats, I saw five bobcats in one year out at Onion. So yeah, we, we and, and we saw one at Slaughter Creek. Uh, Hunter got a good picture of that one. Uh, so yeah, bobcats are pretty, I bet most of our properties on the WQPL and probably BCP too have, uh, have had bobcats on it for sure. Still have bobcats, which is great. Very cool. All right, question three. Which wildland staff member is most likely to teach how to build berms and swales to rehydrate a landscape? Kevin Thiessen, Jim O'Donnell, Bill Reiner or Sherry Cole? Probably Sherry. And that is Vireo Preserves' Jim O'Donnell. And thank you to all the volunteers who have spent hours of their time working to restore and maintain the natural beauty of Vireo Preserve. All right, question four. Fungi can be found on the wildlands in cave ecosystems, being used to inoculate and break down logs, connecting tree root systems, or all of the above. And that is D, all of the above. And this gorgeous photo shows the turkey tail mushroom, which is sometimes utilized to inoculate and break down logs on the BCP and restoration efforts. Um, and question five, uh, about how many species of plants have been identified by volunteer botanist Tom Watson on the Onion Creek track of the water quality protection lands? It's a lot. <laughs> and it's about 450 species of plants. So this, in this picture, Tom Watson shown here in the yellow shirt teaching a, a pre-COVID grass class out on the wildlands. All right, in question six, each spring volunteers survey golden cheek warblers and record sightings of banded birds on the BCP to help biologists monitor populations. Each banded bird has a unique combination of bands on their legs. What is the correct band combination that a volunteer would report for the warbler picture here? Silver, white, orange, yellow, yellow, white, orange, silver, or silver, orange, white, yellow. And the correct reading is yellow, white, orange, silver. So when a bird is facing you, the left leg is your right. Um, and volunteers spend time every spring on city and county properties, patiently looking and listening for the golden cheek warbler. And we wanna say thank you to our reciting volunteers who made it happen even in this unprecedented season. And that is the end of the rounds and answers. And with that, I think that's, that's it. 
Anybody? Thanks have everybody for being here. Thanks for spending your evening with us. Yeah. Thanks for Important. coming out. Keeping the knowledge. Exactly. The yeah, important knowledge. <laughs> the zebra on the WQPL. Thank you. Go, guys. Thanks, everybody.